Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest today is producer and engineer Chris S.D. First of all, there's a new phenomenon that's happening on YouTube, and it's music reaction videos. Yeah, this is kind of weird, but it seems like people like to watch other people who are listening to a song and then reacting to it. And in fact, some of these videos have tens of millions of views. And there's one channel in particular that has 2 million subscribers, if you can believe that. So again, what it is, is they listen to the music and then they react to it. And they get excited and they talk about the artist. And for some reason, people like to watch that. There's one channel in particular, Zeos and B. Lou. Every video they put out has millions of views. Some are way beyond 10 million. And again, a couple million subscribers, if you can believe that. Some of the reaction videos actually have many more views, like a lot more views, than the music videos themselves. So what's interesting here is this is one of the cases that falls under the fair use doctrine where an artist or a record label cannot take this down even though they're using their music, because, in fact, it's more like news, and because it's more like news, therefore, it's not a real user-generated video, at least in the eyes of the law, so it kind of skirts all that. The other thing that's interesting is the fact that YouTube tends to recommend these videos, and people think it's because of a quirk in the algorithm that that's happening. So if you look over on the side on a video, you go and search for your favorite music video, and look over on the side... And you'll find on the right sidebar that it will actually show you a number of reaction videos. Now, there's actually a professor from USC that knows the reason why this is happening. It's something called mirror neurons. And it's happening in the brain. And basically, people get great joy from watching other people experience something. And it simulates the experience for them itself. So anyway, keep a lookout for this. Music reaction videos, it's something that's relatively new and yet it's a little on the weird side. If you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyowinnercircle.com. Check out my Hitmakers Club for access to the private Mixers Facebook group, monthly deconstructed hits, mixing workshop and Q&A webinars, a short time access to my core training module bonus go to hitmakersclub.com to learn more nam happened last week and i was there but i didn't see it i was stuck in the laguna b room of the hilton at aes i was in charge of all of the studio sessions which basically meant i was tied up from 8 a.m to 8 p.m every single day and as a result, I get on the floor for about 10 minutes, but only to see my publisher, one of my publishers, and to go down and see the great mixer, Ken Scott, my buddy, for a few seconds. So I saw nothing of the show. That being said, I spoke to a lot of people that gave me a good report. And for everybody, and this includes attendees and exhibitors, they all loved the fact that there was a brand new section of the convention center that was just for audio it was nice and quiet you didn't hear drums or guitars or anything all you heard was just pure audio demonstrations and everybody seemed to like it also it had a good fresh feel and everybody loved the floor i kept on hearing about how cool the floor was and felt good on the feet so that was a good part but there was a whole lot of great new products that were introduced and i'm really sorry that i missed it because you know, I kept on hearing from people, this is actually pretty good. There's more new stuff than we've seen in a long time. So the first one that comes to mind is the Retro Instruments Revolver. And what it is, it's a copy of the old EMI Altec 436 compressor. And EMI took the Altec compressor and they made their own mods to it. And it was made on many famous recordings and especially all the Beatle recordings, if you're really into that. It's about $3,000 for two channels. So if you really wanted an Altec 336, that's a pretty good way to go. Sonovox had something called a Vox Doubler Toolbox, which gives it a very human-like doubling. Now, of course, you can double any number of ways, 
but it never quite sounds like the real thing. And this one seems to have it knocked. 99 bucks for the plug-in sounds pretty good. Of course, if you're into Pro Tools, Pro Tools had a brand new version, Pro Tools 2018, they're calling it. Pretty much all it had was very much improved MIDI as well as processor and channel presets. And that sounds pretty cool, as a matter of fact. If you're into large format consoles, a company called Sound Techniques was there with a 12-foot-long console. And to explain Sound Techniques, you have to understand that way back in the early 70s, most consoles were handmade for each studio. So you couldn't go to a company and say, I want this off the shelf. They were all custom-made. And there was a company that kind of dominated everything before Neve, way before SSL, it was called Sound Techniques. And this was the one that was used in all the Trident studios before Trident made their own consoles, for instance. And you heard it on all the Bowie records, and you heard it on Super Tramp, and you heard it on all sorts of different and wonderful records back then. Well, they're back, and it's a very interesting console. I encourage you to go to soundtechniques.com to look at it because it really has a retro feel. And once you look at it, you'll see what I mean. Avitas Audio had something that was very interesting called a trans drive. And what this is, <laughs> is a box that has a transformer in it, or a number of transformers. And it allows you to actually get that transformer warmth just with this box. So I don't know what the price of it is, but it's a cool idea. Warm Audio was there. I'm a big fan of Warm Audio, and boy, they're out with many new products, especially a couple of microphones, the WA-47 which is a U47 clone, and the 47 Junior. The WA-47 comes in at $899 and the Junior at $299. Warm Audio also had its WA-73, which is like a 1073 module, a Neve 1073, and that was $799. Good price for that. And, of course, they make really good stuff. Now, speaking of interesting reissues, Neumann reissued its U67. This is one of the most famous microphones. It's one of the most beloved microphones. And they reissued it, the U67, which is the tube version of the U87. And it came before the 87, and everybody loves it when they use it. So this is about seven grand, $69.95. Golden Age, who makes some very fine Neve-like gear that's relatively inexpensive, came out with a stereo ribbon mic, the R1ST. So it's a stereo ribbon mic, kind of looks like an RCA, and it's $599. API had a 500 series compressor called the 529, and of course many people just swear by API compressors, so now if you have a 500 rack, you can stick it in there. That's about 2100 bucks. Sony made a big splash because... They came out with a mini version of their famous C800. This is called the C100. What's interesting is it has dual capsules, and it's about $1,399, which gives you about an 80% <laughs> difference in price from a C800. My buddy and great mixer, Andrew Sheps, did another processor with Waves, and this is called the Omnichannel, and it's his version of a channel strip. It's very unique. It looks very cool. And right now it's on sale for 49 bucks. I'm going to pick one up myself because I love anything that Andrew is involved with because it's always very thoughtful and it always sounds great. Tone Lux came out with a couple of very interesting microphones as well. And basically what they are, Sony C37A and C37P clones. So in other words, C37A was a tube microphone that, once again, everybody just loved, but they only made them for a little while. And the P was a transistor version. And now both of them are available from Tone Lux. Don't know what the price is, but boy, I'm going to check them out. And finally, on the very low end, JBL came out with a powered two-way five-inch monitor called an LSR305 for $99. Now, it's powered, $99. And you know that whole LSR series has always sounded great. I've always liked everything that's in that series. So check that out if you really need some inexpensive and small monitors. So there are many more products than what I just mentioned. These are the ones that people have raved about. So you might want to check them out. But as I hear about others, I'll let you know. My guest today is Chris SD, who's a music producer who's worked on five albums that have won Juno Awards, which is basically Canada's Grammys along with the seven nominations. 
He's also been nominated as Engineer of the Year for the year 2012. Chris came up with the idea of starting an online recording studio that brings world-class talent to anyone for indie rates. Sundown Session Studio went online in 2015 and gives artists the chance to work with A-list session players and award-winning engineers no matter where they live. Chris now also teaches songwriters how to license their songs and has created a course called The Art of the Song Pitch, which includes in-depth interviews with top licensing experts who work in the industry every day, as well as some live coaching. It teaches artists step-by-step how to write for licensing, targeting the song for the right licensing opportunities, and finally how to pitch their songs and negotiate the right deal. I spoke with Chris from his studio in Canada. You know, I want to talk to you about a lot of things that you're doing here because you have a very interesting background, but let's start right at the beginning, just your start in the business. Basically, um, I started off as a um, music, you know, as an engineer. And even before then, I was a a musician and I was in a band and used to tour around. And uh, when I was in a band, I decided that um, I needed to learn how to make records on my own. So I really wanted to sort of understand what that magic was. You know, I used to go into studios and it felt like this, you know, dark art, you know, is you'd see this microphone out there and somebody singing into it. And the engineer would have this gear in front of them or her, and they would just be able to dial in these sounds that were, they, they really did feel like magic to me, you know? And I, I wanted to understand how um, certain records made me feel in a way that live music wouldn't. You know, often live music is sort of really uh, put into, it's put on a pedestal in a way as being like, you know, nothing's better than live. But I sort of disagree with certain artists and certain uh, records is you really want to um, find out what their artistic intention was. And they can tweak that in a studio. They can get really in there and do all kinds of cool stuff, you know, off the top of my head. You know, it's just like Pink Floyd to Radiohead to be going back to Jimi Hendrix, you know, whatever. And it was really cool to just hear those those things that they do and even like modern pop, you know, you listen to like, uh, you know, even a newer Britney Spears song, right? Or any, any of those pop girls that are doing stuff. The production is amazing, you know? Yeah. So I wanted to know how to do that. So um, what happened is uh, our band sort of amicably parted ways, you know, it broke up and I was trying to figure out what to do. So I um, got myself I, a little studio in a cabin in the woods and was uh, just basically uh, learning how to record. And luckily I had worked with um, a couple of bigger um, producers and engineers along the way. And I had to learn a lot, you know, about how to do that. So um, I, I got a little bit of a head start there. So I, I, you know, worked hard at that recording sort of just local people and friends, you know, for free or for beer or whatever, you know, trying to figure it all out. And uh, as I got better and better, the the gigs started getting better. And then um, this is in Canada. I'm originally from Canada mm-hmm. and I was in the woods outside of Ottawa in this cabin on a lake. And uh, eventually I started going to the big city of Toronto, you know, more, which is like New York or LA down here. Right. Mm-hmm. So um, I uh, started going there more for gigs. And then eventually I uh, landed a, a spot, a job as the house guy, house engineer at a band studio called Blue Rodeo. And they're not well known down in the U.S. at all, but they're, they fill stadiums in Canada. You know, they're huge up there. So they had their own studio where they'd make their own records. And so, uh, so I got a job there and started, um, you know, engineering and, and, and doing things and, uh, and so on. And then, um, one thing led to another, I started producing more records and, uh, you know, got to work with some notable artists and, uh, they decided to give me a green card to come to LA and do the same thing. So I thought, Hey, weather's better. Why not? You know, nice change. And uh, let's check it out. And uh, so we moved down here. My wife and I at the time, we she was my girlfriend for a long time. We got married and we moved down to L.A. And here we are. Uh, we're currently in, in Santa Monica. And uh, then during my time as a producer, um, what had happened was, is I was working not only with bigger artists, but I was working with, you know, indie artists as well. People whose music I really liked. And I found it really frustrating that they just had a much harder time getting ahead, you know, because I would work on a on a bigger band and they would have, you know, usually a label and a manager and an agent and everything pushing them along. You know, all they had to do was go in the studio, record a record. 
And so uh, it was a lot easier for them. And uh, indie artists would come in and they, they had to start from ground zero, you know, grassroots and you know, build it up and try to get something happening. And, uh, you know, around that time that I was doing this sort of like 2000, sort of, you know, sort of like 2002 to kind of 2007 or something, I really started focusing on music licensing because that was such a great way for them to get exposure. Um, uh, you know, as Moby once said, who was one of the greatest uh, licensing successes ever, he had his music licensed continuously that first record play. He said he did it because he was strategically looking for a way for people to hear his music. So he wasn't really trying to go and make money or he wasn't interested in, I mean, I'm sure he, that was great, but his main focus was trying to get his music into uh, TV and film so that people would know about his record because it wasn't doing so well when it came out. And that was massively successful. I mean, it was huge. So I latched onto this sort of same idea for indie artists and um, started, I had some connections in the industry and then started, you know, trying to help them get their music placed. And as I was sort of going through the process, I really came to understand why certain people got their music licensed and other people didn't. And the biggest thing is that I was able to give music supervisors, who are the people who work on TV and film productions and actually put the music into uh, the production or present it to the director or the producer, um, they're the kind of the gatekeeper. They're the people who sort of you want to be able to get your music into their hands. And I was I stumbled across this thing. It's like, if you figure out what they're looking for, when they're looking for it, and then you give them exactly what they're looking for, you're like in the game. I mean, you're, you're all of a sudden in the top 5% of the people who have submitted their music because suddenly they, and then, then they realize that, you know, wow, Chris does his homework. He knows what he's doing. Um, this is great. Uh, I'm going to call him for other things, you know? And so that was really how the whole thing started. And as I got more experience, I was also sort of just coaching artists, you know, saying like, you know, you want to get your stuff into TV and film. Here's a few people you can call and here's how you should probably go about doing it. And then over time, I refined this sort of way of doing it and people were having success getting into TV and film. So um, when I moved down to L.A., now we also teach uh, people how to do that as well. And we have um, essentially a website called uh, make money from your music.com. And uh, we just, you know, people can join for free and we just basically send out weekly tips and uh, trying to educate people in how to um, actually make this happen in a real way. Not, you know, like, uh, well, there's this option for you. You know, it's like how you can actually get your music into the right hands type of thing. That's very cool, Chris. The only thing is there's a lot of people that kind of, have jumped on that bandwagon. So there's a lot more competition today than there was when you first started this. So Absolutely. that being said, is the formula still the same or has it changed? No, it's, it hasn't changed at all. It's, it's, uh, you're absolutely right that it's become much more saturated, you know, way back when, um, you know, we're talking like 10, 15 years ago, way back when, but, uh, a lot of, um, studios had, uh, uh, composers, you know, that they would use and they would have their sort of the people who were, who would provide music, uh, were basically an establishment. Like they had this, their system down that went way back right from there. And then what happened is that um, the the budget started to drop. So as the budgets dropped, there became much more um, of an ability for indie artists to get in because they didn't want to pay. Like suddenly they didn't have to have an in-house composer. They could sort of farm, farm it out or they didn't have to pay the, you know, the big stars the money anymore because indie artists could record at home and put out a lot more material. And then they could just start basically paying a lot less for it. And then also the internet opened up. So, and then the number of channels increased, right? So instead of like 13 channels of cable or whatever it was back in the 80s and 90s, it was now we're into the hundreds, right? And all of these productions need music. So in a way, you're right. The market, it became this sort of gold rush where everyone was like, oh, I can get my music in. But the thing is, is that so many people do it wrong. 
So even though there's more competition, quote unquote, and people talk about competition, when you talk to the music supervisors, like I know, you know, some in LA here, some very high, high up people, it's pretty much the same for them. It's like kind of who's got the right stuff, who they, who's on their contact list, who they know. They're, they're inundated with emails. They don't open them all. You know, it's just the, that's just what they've done is they put it aside. So to get your music into their hands, it's a combination of giving them being first good at what you do. You've got to follow your strengths. You know, you don't, don't think that you can like get a studio and like in, you know, 20 years ago or whatever, when it first started, you could do things like do a hip hop track and do a bluegrass track and do this, you know, you could do that and just sort of put them out there. And now because the competition is a lot higher, you need to focus on your strengths. So you first, you figure out what you're good at and, and stick to that. And then when you do that, in order to really separate yourself, you can do this research, which we teach people how to do. Um, I mean, just in a, um, a couple of tips here is you can go to tunefind.com. That's T-U-N-E find.com. And you can find out what music was in what shows you know, and what artists were, were, were placed. And you can start to look at the type of music that got into a specific TV show, say, and then if find one that fits your music. So if you're an artist and you write and you have a certain kind of music, if yours fits in the same playlist as what the music supervisor is putting into that show, and you'll notice a pattern, right? They're not going to be all over the place with a, cause they have a certain pop culture they're going for and so on. Um, then you want to target your music to that specific thing. And then once you've targeted it and you've, you get sort of their, you, their contact information, you can go to IMDB and check out who worked on what show or what movie. Um, you can figure out who the music supervisor is. Even doing that, just doing that, you're already way ahead of the game because 90% of the musicians out there, what they're doing is they're using a shotgun approach. They're basically doing creating their music. They're throwing it up on a music library or something like that. Like there's these music libraries for those who don't know. There's a lot of libraries out there that put a bunch of music up in the cloud. And then they let music supervisors know that people can, they can come along and per peruse their catalog and find out what they're looking for. Well, there's so many libraries and they're not all created equally. That's for sure. So a lot of musicians just fire it all up there and then they hope. They hope someone's going to come along yeah. and find their music. And that's absolutely not what you need to do. You need to grab the ball and you need to put it in the end zone yourself. You know, you don't, you can't just hope someone's going to come and discover you. So really what I'm teaching people is not, it's not a magic button. You know, it's not like, uh, you know, if you do what I tell you, it's, you know, you're going to start getting placed and it's this thing. It takes some work. Um, actually, as one of our members said, um, which was a nice compliment. They said, you know, um, they've really enjoyed all the information they've gotten. They said they feel like I gave them the pickaxe and the shovel and I showed them where the gold is, but I'm not going to do the digging for you. You know, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. you got to do That's that good. yourself. Yeah. But the, the, the trick is, is getting yourself into that top 5% so that you're a real contender and you're not one of this, the mass or the vast, uh, artists out there who don't know what they're doing just because they don't understand it. But isn't it true, Chris, that songwriting and writing for television are two different disciplines? So if you're a songwriter or if you're an artist and you've just done an album, it doesn't necessarily mean that that music is going to work on television, especially if there's vocals on it, where they just want cues that are, are instrumental which requires a different mindset to actually give them what they want. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but um, just so you, you know, there's uh, basically there's a whole composer world, right? So there's a about, you know, say there's half of it is composed. If you watch a sitcom or whatever and you hear all that orchestration on there, uh, that's a composer doing musical cues. They're writing to picture. Uh, and that is very, uh, that's only licensing. They're not artists. But then the other half, you listen to a lot of movies, a lot of shows and so on, and they have songs on there by artists. And the the trick is if you're if you're an artist and this is something that people need to remember to do is when you're mixing your song is always get an instrumental only mix, uh, because if you don't have an instrumental only mix, uh, you're absolutely right. They can't place a song underneath 
some dialogue if there's some lyrics going on, right? But you'll also get on to, to a lot of shows that many people watch out there. And then, you know, in the end credits or in the middle of a of the show in a particular scene, someone's walking through a park or there's a love scene. There's a song in there with lyrics and everything. And it's and it's great. Now, there there are I'll touch on that in a second, but there definitely are, uh, as to your point, things that you need to remember if you're submitting a song for a sync or you're writing for sync. And some of those are things like you want to have universal lyrics. So you don't want to write a song about Bobby, and then they're trying to put the the, the song into a, a, a movie, and the lead character's name is Jed or like whoever, right? Yeah. John. Yeah. And so you can't, um, you got to make sure you're very careful about those types of things. So you want to write for um, basically the seven root stories. There's seven root stories in in plot writing and you want to write for one of those seven root stories all plots are based around seven stories that are they've sort of broken it into seven main stories and as long as you're being more general so you're right to to, to your point if, if you have have a song about bobby and you can't you're not going to be able to get it very far unless it's specifically about something that whose name is is that but if you have um music that is about um something more uh, general but still captures people's spirit of the of the moment they can definitely place that but lots of artists get get uh, placed i've interviewed a bunch um well, not a bunch of several on our website um who get their music placed all the time so uh, and and one of the most recent successes um that we had was um getting a song into a show called saving hope for thirty thousand dollars um she got thirty thirty grand for the placement and um you know it's it's basically um it was just a song it was a cover song and so it got put into the season finale of it so there's definitely spots for for artists for sure that being said what is your audience and i'm curious because i'm wondering how much they know about licensing when they come to you do you have to take them from a to z or they're already at m yeah, right. So, uh, great question. So, the predominant, I would say most of the people, barely most, I would say are beginners. Um, and then we have, I think like in, in the class that we actually have now, there's well, probably... Well, well, wait, when you say beginners, what do you mean? Beginning songwriters or people that don't know about licensing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, they're songwriters who know nothing about licensing. And they want to try to get their music into TV and film. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's like, you know, probably out of those, there's like maybe 30, between 40 and 30 percent, an estimate of people who actually have got placements before or they're trying to build their their career further. So we have a, a mix of people. Um, the bottom line is that it's not rocket science. You know, it's just that. Um, I figured out a way that works. So it's this thing that you can do and you can put it together yourself. I mean, if you do enough research and spend a, you know, took me a few years to, to figure it out, but you can do it. I mean, all the information's on the internet and you could really uh, do that. But I, the whole idea is to try to fast track people and say, hey, you know, don't waste those songs doing that, that the wrong way. Um, and the other thing you want to be careful of is not sort of getting um, blacklisted. That's kind of a heavy word. But if you send, continuously send music supervisors things that aren't relevant to what they're working on, they're a subpar production, um, you know, you, you don't know how to sort of write the right email to them or con how to contact them, they're just going to stop responding to you. You know, they'll just kind of put your stuff straight in the junk folder, right? You want to avoid that, especially if you're new. When you're coming into the scene, you want to do things right, you know, and um, so much of it is about um, great attitude and, and being like, yeah, I, you know, even if they get back to you and say, I loved your stuff, but I can't use it. Great. Well, how can I, you know, improve um, what what you need? You know, if you solve a problem for them, that's an amazing thing. And uh, I did an interview um, with a music supervisor and, uh, she talks so much about that. She says, we remember people like that. You know, if somebody yeah. is trying to solve my problem and they, they, they've done their homework and they know what I'm looking for said, if I can't use it right away, it goes on my special hard drive with a tag and, and something might come up in a, you know, a month or two or a year. And all of a sudden it's like, they're like, oh yeah, I remember that. That was, 
I know that was an awesome song and I'll, these guys are great to work with. Um, that's really cool. But I think you're right though. A big problem with the industry is protocol and not knowing what it is. Yeah. If you're trying to break in any aspect of it, it's one thing to have talent and it's another thing to actually know how to market it. And marketing, it could be just providing your information to somebody, but there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. So that's so important. Absolutely. No, there's, that's a, that's a, a big part of it. And relationships are, are extremely important, right? Yeah. So, you know, in our course, we didn't want to, um, like I teach, I teach the course based on my experience and then having interviewed a bunch of industry experts, right? So I actually went out and interviewed a bunch of them. And in fact, I had, um, there's some people I know that are so high up that I can't interview them. Like I, they had, they signed a, um, what was it called? Like a non-disclosure agreement or just some other name of it. Yeah. They're like, they can't, you know, if it's like a big network, they're like, I, I can't, but I was able to sit there and chat with them and hang out. And a couple of them are good friends. So it's like, you know, getting the inside scoop behind the scenes, like how it works yeah. was invaluable, you sure. know? So that, that was huge. And then, so those relationships, as you're saying, are super important. So in our course, we not only like, it's not like, oh, here's a course, here's how you do it. Bye. Good luck. You know, what we're doing is we actually ramp people up. And at the end, they get to pitch their songs to music supervisors that we have on a panel so that even, you know, they might get a song placed right there. But even if they don't, they've already made a relationship. You know, they've already, they introduce themselves, they, they do it right, we show them how to do it, and they, they've got music targeted because we did that in the course, and they're giving them exactly what they need. And then they they can just email them and say, hey, you know, I, I talked to you in the court, like that's instant foot in the door. Yeah. And then if they cold call someone, they can be like, you know, so-and-so liked my song, I submitted it for this, and I thought, well, it might be better for you. Well, that's instant instant karma right there, right? So it, you, you got to know how to do it and then get your foot in the door with the relationships and using the protocol that you just talked about. So let me throw this out here because perhaps you've run into this or maybe it doesn't happen anymore. I hope it doesn't. In the 90s, I was writing a lot of songs and my partner and I placed a number of them on a top 10 television show. This still plays around the world and I still get checks for 35 cents. <laughs> <laughs> but that being said, the only way we could get the songs in the show was if we cut in the music supervisor as a third writer. What? Yes. You're kidding me. Yeah. Uh, this is a top 10 show? Yes. It was a huge show. It's a huge show. And, and the music supervisor that you cut in for that is... Uh, still cut in for it so they get a check too yes wow bobby that i have never heard of that if i mean if the network i mean whoever if it's a top 10 show and the network that they work for ever got wind of that they'd be out they'd be gone i mean they're basically they're not supposed to do that <laughs> yeah i know so well i i've never heard you know and i've you know, gotten music placed and I know lots of people place music and that's never, you'll, you'll pay like, uh, if you have a licensing agent or you have a published, now this was a music supervisor, right? This wasn't an agent or anything like that. Yeah. That's amazing. That's the very first time I've ever heard of anything. I mean, they're, they're, they're on, on thin ice, to be honest. I mean, you know, it's a, it could easily blow up in their face. But that being said, isn't it a fact that Haim Saban Again, in the 90s, who had the Saturday morning cartoon empire, it was the same thing. He had all these writers, but he had to be a co-writer. It built his personal fortune into a billion dollars. Oh, yeah. I mean, you. there's definitely cases of that. So if you're like, if you take a song and you go to a famous artist and you say, hey, I want you to cover the song, and they say, sure, they might ask you for a cut. Like, I want to be a writer. I want to be, you know, I want to be part of it. Yeah. That definitely happens for sure. But in, um, in the sync world for a music supervisor, if they're working for a studio or they're working, if they're not like an independent, if they're like an independent music supervisor and they say, uh, you know, decide to try, try to cut a deal with you. Um, I could see that, you know, maybe being something that is doable, but I've never heard of that let alone someone who's doing a top 10 TV show. I mean, that's, they're not allowed to do that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. to be making money 
off off of the artist at the behest, like employed by a studio using leveraging the studio to make money. I mean, that's, that's, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, first I've heard of it. Now, of course, this was the nineties, so I'm sure things have changed. (laughs) I'm hoping things have changed because that put a bad feeling in my mouth, but I have to say I made money and I wouldn't have (laughs) if we didn't do it. So, you know, there's the, the yin and yang of it there. Oh, sure. And you have to sort of decide on your own with how how these things work. But uh, just so you know, the industry norm uh, by far nowadays is not like that. You know, that's not something that you expect to run into. Let's talk about the art of the song pitch. So that's your course. Yeah. And can you give me some details about it? Sure. Um, So essentially what it is, is uh, it basically it's a it's a step by step course that teaches people from the very beginning how to start out either writing for TV and film. So there's two types of people who would be uh, in sync. People who are writing for TV and film specifically, like they say, I want to make some money. I want to try to get music into TV and film. And uh, we teach them sort of how to do that. And then there are artists who are right for their fans. They have a fan base. They don't want to alter the way they write. You know, they don't want to, you know, quote unquote, sell out for the for whatever they're writing for. They say, this is my song, but I'm totally prepared to, to license it. And so we, we basically teach them in tandem and they're very similar approaches in sort of how to start off. So the very first thing that you're going to want to do is you need to do your research. And as I touched on before, using things like tunefind.com, um, you know, IMDB, uh, there's other things that you can use like similar artists to find similar you can sort of target your stuff easier if you find out who you're most similar to uh, and figure out if, you know, if you find someone who's been synced and you want to find out other artists that are, that, that are, you know, you, you basically want to make sure that your music sounds in the same playlist as the music that's getting placed in the TV show or um, ads type or movie type. So you do your research and then, um, then we basically show you how to write. So touching on what you said earlier, there's the whole writing module, which talks about things to avoid. Like, for example, if you are writing a song for TV and film, or if you're submitting a song, you don't want to, um, you want to make sure that you don't have something, if it's an instrumental only, that has a lot of mids, mid-range things going on. So if you have a bunch of guitars or synths up in the mid-range, that's going to interfere with the dialogue. So you have to be sure that when you mix your song or you're, you know, if you've already mixed it, you've got to pick one that doesn't have a ton going on, like an aggressive guitar song is going to be difficult underneath a, a dialogue, right? You can do it, but you have to carve out the mids a little bit and create mm-hmm. a pocket. So we teach you sort of those things, how to write for the, for the, um, for the root stories, you know, the, and the, ly- how to, the lyrical principles, that things you should avoid and things that, that are going to help you um, talk about building your song and all of that stuff. And then we talk about the production of it. Like you want to make sure that again, it fits in the same playlist and having reference songs and, and then things to look out for when you're mixing and you're producing your music, you know, how to go and find a producer. If you're just a songwriter, basically I I explain how you can get a producer, what you should be asking them, some deal points. If there, if there are deal points with working with them, some tips on how to get top guys for a lot less money. And I know this because I'm a, music producer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then things like, um, doing it at home. If you record at home and you're, and you're good enough to do it, um, sort of some tips and tricks and how to get world-class sounds at home, the fundamentals of recording that if you just follow these steps and you practice, you will be able to create as good tracks as people can in a multi-million dollar studio. Mm. Um, and then we go into what's called vetting. So a big thing is that a lot of us, uh, you know what it's like where uh, all of our own individual problems some sometimes seem uh, uh, a lot more difficult to handle. And yet if a friend comes to you with their problem, we just see the solution so easily, you know, and yeah. we find it so easy to advise them. You just got to do that. And, you know, and they kind of nod at you going like, wow, I wish I had thought of that. Well, we're all a little bit like that with our music as well. We tend to get attached to certain kinds of songs that we might have written about maybe someone we care about or something that is important to us that doesn't translate in the song as much and other people couldn't care less about. So you, what you need to do 
is you need to take your music and uh, get a listening group together, just like a focus group, the same way that movie studios or ad studios or TV pilots, they always start out with something with a focus group and they test it first. And that, you know, TV movie marketing trick works great when you're pitching music to TV and film. So you want to have a listening group that's going to tell you certain things about your music. Now, it's not like, you know, do you like the song? That's not what you want to ask them. You want to ask them, what does this vocal remind you of? Like, who does it remind you of? Those are things that are valuable, that are going to help you see things that you wouldn't normally have seen before. Your concept of your music can be far different than, than other people's. And I learned this when I was producing music because I would have just naturally have a group of peers, trusted friends and, and, and uh, producers who I could just play the song for. And, you know, and I trusted them with the music if I had to send it to them or something um, where they would just kind of give their input. And you'd, it was amazing how often you would get back these, these um, insights into the music that was common amongst most of them, right? You, yeah, you, they, yeah. you don't pick the outlier opinions, you pick the ones that are common to them. So we teach people how to put together the right listening group, the questions that they should ask them at what stage. So there's some at the writing stage, there's some at the production stage. And then finally, uh, we have a module on pitching your music. Like how do you take what you just did, that's it's you've done your research, so it's targeted, you wrote it right, you produced it right, so you've got this, you know, great asset in your hands. You've got this piece of gold. How do you get it into someone's hands? So we explain sort of how to do that. And then um, that's the essence of being in the top echelon of people that are getting their music into TV and film. And uh, just by doing, just by doing that and being ahead of the rest, your, your, you know, your chances of doing that are incredible. And then expanding your relationships as you develop your reputation. So if you get a, a sink and you get another sink, that's a notch on your belt, right? Yeah. And you can use that as you approach other people. And um, now, again, I want to reemphasize, Bobby, that I'm not, this isn't something that's like, uh, you know, one of these like, uh, buy my course now and learn how to, you know, and make a million dollars. I mean, it's not, that's not why I'm doing this. It's, it's I want to take people in a real way and say, here's how you do it. You've got to do the work. You've got to make it happen. I've had successes. We have people in our class, you know, who've, who've totally had, had great successes. We've had, um, you know, um, people like, for example, the Saving Hope thing I told you for $30,000. Yeah. We have someone in our class now whose name is Paul Cars. He just scored a second feature film called Professor Mac. Um, there's another one called Me Megan McDuffie. Uh, she got a song into Made in China, Napoleon. Napolinatano, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Um, another guy, Al Hobden, just signed a big publishing deal. And then I just got an email from, an, uh, from a current uh, course member who's down over at Hans Zimmer Studio doing some work. So, you know, this stuff works. Like it's, it's again, it's not like this um, big secret. You can kind of go out and do it yourself, but it's, I've been able to collect all this information over time and put it into a way that's like, you can absorb it, understand it and make it happen and not waste two, three years trying to figure it all out. So that's really the essence of the art of the song pitch. Very cool. Very exciting. Sounds like there's everything you need to know just in one course. And as you say, fast tracking is important because yeah, it's good to learn on your own, but you don't learn everything. You know, when you do it yourself, it's nice to have a mentor, somebody to show you. Yeah. The and the other thing that I do too, Bobby, is I, I also do coaching calls. So every week I'm always on there, you know, yeah. and we're in the middle of a course right now. And, uh, you know, I told my class, like, holidays are coming up, but you can hit me up on our private Facebook group uh, under the modules. You can ask me questions. I'm always there to help. And that has been really big, too, because it's one thing kind of to learn something, but then also to take that and say, well, yeah, but what about this? Or like, how do you do that? And the, these questions and be able to ask these questions. So um, ultimately, I want to put in as much work as it takes to get people the most success possible, because their success is my success, yeah. right? If they win, I'm winning. And, and that's ultimately what it's all about. So the, the, the more music that they place, the better that they do, the, the, the more I can keep doing this course and stuff like that. So that's, that's the bottom line with that. Very cool, Chris. Last question. 
What is the best piece of business advice that either someone imparted to you or maybe you learned along the way? Aha. Okay. That's, um, that's an interesting one. I, um, I've used this one before. I've told people about this. So this may not be, it may be, may share the top ranking with a couple of other ones that I can't think of right now or whatever, but I'll just talk about this one. When I was a, um, engineer, in, a, in the studio, when I first got my first big job in Toronto, I was kind of like this guy who would, you know, sit in there a bit of a, you know, kind of geeking out on audio and, and you know, I was into the, the certain records and I'd spent hours in there and I'd work with the artists and stuff like that. And I just enjoyed being sort of my, by myself, doing my thing and then working with the artists in the studio. And then I had a friend who I met on a video shoot for an artist that I had, I had produced. And uh, he said, hey, man, you want to come out and meet at a club later? And I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, so I met him at a club and he was from a different city and he was basically hanging out in the club. We we're having a beer. And all of these people in my hometown in the industry kept coming up to him and saying, hey, Mike, how you doing? Hey, Mike, what's going on? Hey, Mike, what's the, da, da, da? hey, I've got this project. And I was like looking at him going like, how do all these people know you? You know, like he's not a schmoozer or like a Gabby guy or anything. He's pretty like unassuming, chill dude, you know? And like, how do you know all these people? And he goes, I just go out. Mm. I'm like, what do you mean you go out? He said, I just go to everything I'm invited to. Or if I see something's happening, I just go to it. And I just make an effort. And then I just meet people. And I just get talking with them. And uh, all of a sudden, I've got things going on. And I really took that to heart, you know, so I started doing the same thing to just to sort of expand my network and, and, and do that. And without being schmoozy, without being going to, uh, paid events and trying to go, going there with an agenda it was about going to shows and it was about going to, you know, certain events and just being there and, and just having fun, having a beer and talking to people. And it's amazing how that works. So to translate that to people who don't live in cities like that and don't have that sort of personal network, it works exactly the same online, you know, is that figure out like who you want to kind of have a relationship with and who you're sort of like the vibe of. Like I, you know, um, I love your podcasts, right? So I went through some of your stuff and, and I was like, this is cool. I'd love to be on there too, right? These are things that are, that are sort of that, that work is a synergistic thing, mm, right? Yeah. So I think that that is super important for people to always remember is that don't be afraid to get yourself out there, drop people an email, uh, get on some forums. Uh, if you're on Facebook and uh, someone's friend is something, ask for an introduction. If it's something that relative to your business, just be you, be friendly, but be open. And, and, thing, and, and you know, if you get the odd rejection. I mean, most people are great people. You get, you get the odd no or whatever, just whatever, let it run off your back, you know, and just, uh, and just be, that's the, the biggest thing I think that can help, help people because we're all in this together, right? We're, yeah. it's very difficult for one person to do it. Elon Musk can't build the cars himself. He can't build the rocket himself. He's the, he comes up with a lot of ideas, I'm sure. And he's the face plate of it, but there's a whole group of people and I'll bet you there's a community of people. They're not just employees. There's a community of friends. They hang out and they share this thing as a bit of a tribe. You want to kind of do that. Just go out there, trust in other people, and uh, make those connections. And and then you don't have to stick with the ones that don't that you don't that you don't like. You know, you don't have to like everyone. Not everyone has to like you. Just just hang out with the people that you think are cool and they think you're cool and you're going to be much more powerful as a, as, a, as a team and as a group. To find out more about Chris and the art of the song pitch, go to makemoneyfromyourmusic.com. That's all one word, makemoneyfromyourmusic, one word, dot com. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyowinnersircle.com. To listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab or Go to bobbyowinnercircle.com or find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Mixcloud, and Google Play. At bobbyosinski.com and bobbyowinnercircle.com, you'll also find a sign-in form for my newsletter for alerts for new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time. 